The settlement of Utah was unique in the history of the American West. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints moved en masse to a remote section of the interior West where they hoped to establish a new society structured by the principles of their faith. Mormon visual culture and the American West explores how images both represented and shaped this experience. Visual culture engaged with Latter-day Saint theology and contributed to Latter-day Saint worship while helping to construct the social experience of life in Utah Territory. This exploration of art in 19th century Utah offers a new perspective on Western art and on religious art, revealing a fascinating history of how images helped create a new American religion and helped colonize the West. As a new religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had to navigate the contested relationship of images and worship. 19th century Mormons used images to record sacred history, teach principles of Mormon doctrine, and even to stage sacred rituals. The concept of vision was at the core of Mormon visuality. To Latter-day Saints, vision meant physical sight, but visions were also revelatory moments when people saw beyond the physical realm. Mormonism was founded through visions, as, for example, when, as Joseph Smith described, the angel Moroni led him to a place where the golden plates were buried that he would later translate as the Book of Mormon, which is a subject that the artist C.C.A. Christensen painted in this scene from his Mormon panorama. Mormon artists developed aesthetic strategies to engage Mormon theology through images. Christensen and his contemporaries represented the visionary not as a kind of cerebral or interior spiritual experience, but as a very physical, visible connection between heaven and earth. Latter-day Saint artists gave their viewers an opportunity to vicariously witness these visions. As such, they focused less on the iconic, metaphorical, or ethereal, and more on the tangible, sensate, and physical. Christensen's representation of Joseph Smith's assassination in the Mormon panorama, for example, is not a symbolic meditation on martyrdom. It's a carefully staged rendering of a very specific physical place at a very specific moment. The hats and coats on the beds, the writing materials on the desk, the arrangement of the furniture, all carefully considered to signal that this is really what you would have seen if you had really been there. It's precisely the kind of image that Mormon leader George Q. Cannon held as the ideal. As he phrased it, accurate even in the minor details. Yet, of course, this claim to dispassionate physical reality helps conceal Christensen's viewpoint and his agenda. And recognizing artists' agendas is critical because Mormonism wasn't a religious tradition separate from the rest of life. It structured nearly every aspect of social experience for Latter-day Saints in Utah Territory. For example, Mormon artists made images that documented but also participated in colonization. Dan Wegelin's painting of Bishop Samuel Benyon's farm in Taylorsville exemplifies the Latter-day Saints' view of their settlement as a divinely appointed and divinely aided endeavor. The orderly, verdant farm boasts of the Mormons' agricultural success in the semi-arid Great Basin through irrigation, a stark contrast between the green fields of the Salt Lake Valley in the midground and the barren brown of the surrounding country. Settlers saw their farms as fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy that the desert would blossom as the rose, attributing their success to divine favor, which Weglin hints at with the celestial spotlight illuminating the Benyon estate through parted clouds. Other aspects of colonization were harder to celebrate. Mormon settlers arrived in the Great Basin expecting to convert and assimilate the numerous people who were already there. Christensen's image of Joseph Smith preaching to Sauk and Meskwaki people in Illinois shortly before Latter-day Saints left for Utah represents the 19th century Mormon view that Native Americans were descendants of the civilizations described in the Book of Mormon, and that once restored to this alleged heritage, they would join with the Latter-day Saints. In practice, however, settlers displaced the region's Ute, Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Diné peoples. They upended their economic and food support systems, and they responded to native resistance with brutal violence. By the late 19th century, 
Most native people in the region had been forcibly confined on remote reservations, and Latter-day Saints refocused their search for the descendants of the Book of Mormon to Latin America. Artists like George Ottinger helped assuage settler guilt by creating a fictional history in which Native Americans had always lived wild in the mountains rather than settled in the valleys, which Ottinger painted as completely empty and free for the taking prior to Mormon settlement. Artists also engaged in a contentious national political arena in which Mormons were at the center. The debate over religious freedom and the definition of the family spurred by the Latter-day Saints' practice of plural marriage, a form of polygamy in which some Mormon men married multiple women simultaneously. While outside observers developed an image of Mormons as licentious, tyrannical, and anti-American, Mormons responded with self-representations arguing for their civility and honor, and for their right to define marriage as a free exercise of religion. However, artists recognized that images depicting plural families would have attracted more derision than sympathy, so they focused instead on creating an image of Latter-day Saints as an unjustly persecuted minority. Scenes of Mormonism's tumultuous early history were ideal for this purpose. Christensen's Mormon Panorama, for example, reframed attacks on the first generation of Mormons in the 1830s and 1840s for audiences beginning in the late 1870s to argue that contemporary anti-polygamy efforts were equally unjust and equally motivated by religious prejudice. Latter-day Saints also worked to change public sentiment through images proclaiming Mormon gentility and refinement, especially in images that countered the stereotype of plural wives as deluded, helpless, or degraded. An engraving of Eliza R. Snow, commissioned as the frontispiece for Edward W. Tollage's The Women of Mormondom from a photograph by Charles W. Carter, represents one of the most famous Mormon women of the 19th century a respected poet, intellectual, and women's suffrage advocate with a national reputation who had also been a plural wife of both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Snow's portrait offers an elevated image of Mormon womanhood, her elegant attire attesting to her status, and her pensive expression and the books at her side reminding viewers of her intellectual prowess. Female Mormon leaders like Snow used visual culture not only to bolster the image of Latter-day Saints on the national stage, but also to elevate the status of women within Mormon culture. I explore the fascinating irony in 19th century Mormon polygamy. It was an incredibly patriarchal system that oppressed women in multiple ways. And yet, especially for high-status Mormon women, plural marriage opened opportunities for religious, civic, and commercial power that were not available to most other American women at the time. A number of women took advantage of the plural marriage system to advance their careers in art, including Sarah Ann Burbage Long, who, as the fourth wife of John Vara Long, likely benefited from the efficiencies of household management that came with polygamy to establish a career as an art and music teacher, to create artworks on commission, and to enter work in public exhibitions where she won numerous awards. I illustrate her group portrait of Brigham Young and other Mormon leaders in the book. Long is just one early example of the numerous Latter-day Saint women who addressed the complicated overlap of religion and gender in the Mormon world through art. And she was followed by a generation of female Mormon artists, including some whose works are still among the most iconic Mormon images. Utah's territorial era was a time of constant change, and it concluded with a major transition as the Latter-day Saints gradually ended the practice of polygamy as part of the process of achieving statehood in 1896. Simultaneously, Utah Latter-day Saints sought to achieve better relations with the nation as a whole and developed a new image of Mormons as hardy pioneers who had contributed to the American project of nation building through their work to tame the deserts of the Intermountain West. I conclude the book by focusing on an early 20th century artwork that embraces this new pioneer mythology, Mahan Rai Young's Siegel Monument on Temple Square in Salt Lake City. This prominent public representation of Mormonism is surprisingly mute about Mormon theology. 
Instead of the angelic visions of Joseph Smith's restoration, it offers a natural miracle commemorating the seagulls that Latter-day Saints believed had saved their early settlers from starvation by devouring the hordes of crickets that had threatened their harvests. Mahan Rayong was the perfect choice to bridge Mormon and non-Mormon worlds. Although a grandson of Brigham Young, Mahan Rayong was not a practicing Latter-day Saint. And his artwork offers Mormon viewers an opportunity to see divine providence in the goal's arrival, or for non-Mormon viewers, an image of Mormon pioneers as indefatigable exemplars of America's pioneering spirit. This 20th century mythology of Mormon pioneers makes it easy to assume that these artists were merely making simple illustrations of the world they lived in, when in fact they were making sophisticated visual arguments advancing specific cultural, political, and religious claims. It's also easy to assume that pioneer Mormon art was supplanted by an utterly different, polished, professional aesthetic beginning with the art missionaries who were sent to Paris in the 1890s. And yet, although it might look very different in 20th and 21st century iterations, much of the visual culture produced by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and consumed by Mormon audiences still tends toward an iconic, truth-signaling naturalism that earlier generations of Mormon artists developed in the 19th century. I hope you'll enjoy reading about all of this in much more detail in Mormon Visual Culture and the American West, and I hope you'll appreciate that the intertwining histories of art, religion, and colonization are much more complicated and hopefully much more interesting than at first glance.